Professor Sachs, thank you for being with uh, the National Greek Television today. Uh, thank you. I'm in August, you wrote an article, an article in Al Jazeera, and I quote, a devastating regional war is just around the corner unless the international community acts quickly and decisively to secure this two-state solution. We saw the missile attack from Iran to Israel. How do you see this crisis evolving, and how feasible do you think is a two-state solution now? Look, everything is about politics. Uh, there's uh, a, a lot of uh, back and forth and bravado and show of force, but fundamentally, this crisis can only be solved politically. Uh, there are two peoples, uh, the uh, Israelis, Jews, uh, and the Palestinian uh, Arabs, and they each need uh, their state. They need political self-determination. Israel has a state. It's trying to dominate uh, the Palestinians. The Palestinians uh, uh, deserve their state. They have international law on their side. Uh, and uh, yet Israel and the United States have been blocking that for decades. And mm -hmm. so this war continues uh, until there is a political solution. Now, taking into account yesterday's uh, events, how do you see Israel responding to uh, the uh, Iranian missile attack? We know how Israel would like to respond. It would like the United States to go to war mm -hmm. on Israel's behalf. Mm -hmm. The question isn't how Israel would respond. The question is the United States. We have to understand Israel can't do anything with the United States. All the big talk of Netanyahu, for example, at the UN that Israel's arm extends throughout uh, the Middle East, <laughs> that's the United States Air Force he's talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, so. The question is about the United States policy, not about Israel's policy. Israel mm -hmm. would like to rule the Middle East. Yeah. So what? Uh, this is the United States we're talking about. Mm -hmm. The United States should want peace. It should want two states. It should stop blocking peace. This is really the question. Mm -hmm. Because as long as this goes on, the chance of devastation is real. Uh, Iran is real. It has uh, Russia as its uh, military uh, ally, of course. Uh, Israel is not going to defeat that. The United States, if it goes to war with Iran, is going to face uh, an, another theater of war with Russia. Do we really want nuclear war to end everything? That's the question of Ukraine. That's the question of the Middle East. Can somebody learn to be grown-ups and to compromise, which is what's needed? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In a month from now, there will be national elections in the United States. Do you see different ways that uh, any of the two candidates will handle the situation in the Middle East? No. This doesn't have anything to do with the elections. Uh, mm -hmm. This has to do with the American deep state. Mm -hmm. How is the CIA, the Pentagon, uh, the permanent security establishment viewing this? The elections don't really make much difference. We know that. So you don't think that an election of, say, Donald Trump will make any alterations in the U.S. Uh, uh, involvement in the Middle East? Look, uh, the only thing they're arguing about is who loves Israel more. Mm. This is American politics. Mm -hmm. This is theater. Mm. Uh, this is not how real policy gets determined in the United mm -hmm. States. Mm -hmm. You've talked about the West's dangerously simple-minded narrative about Russia and China. Can you a little bit elaborate on that? Yes, the United States uh, mentality is to run the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it's to tell its allies, uh, like in Greece or throughout Europe, we run the world, have no fear, listen to us, do what we say, host our bases. Mm -hmm. We're NATO, we run the world. Uh, this is uh, a, a, an increasingly delusional scenario because China is, uh, as they say, a pure competitor. Uh, it's just a powerful country. Uh, it's four times the population of the United States. It's got twice the industrial capacity of the United States. Uh, it's got a vast military capacity. Russia is a nuclear superpower. The idea that the United States runs the world is a, is a kind of comic book story. Uh, the United States uh, cannot uh, run the world because it faces countries that don't want to be run by the United States. Mm -hmm. We are in a multipolar world. Mm -hmm. We need to learn to deal with each other peacefully without blowing up the world. This is the basic story. Mm -hmm. The Americans don't like that story uh, because they like the fact that this is an American world, so they deny 
the reality of China. They deny the reality of Russia. Uh, Israel doesn't like that uh, story. It wants to dominate the Middle East, which it, uh, it, it thinks it does because uh, the United States military does its bidding. But the truth is we're in a multipolar world. Either we talk with the other powers, we negotiate, we compromise, we listen to their red lines, we uh, accept that they have red lines, we have red lines, we act like grown-ups, or in the end there will be some devastating accident uh, because someone will take seriously their comic book view of the world and will end up in a nuclear war. You just said the comic view of the, of, of, of the world. Is there room for compromise and negotiations with uh, dictators? It's not a matter of dictatorship. The, the United States, we call it a democracy. Do you think anyone asks the opinion of the American people about any of these wars? Nobody does. Mm. This has nothing to do with the American people. Do you think that the U.S. government tells one bit of truth any day about Ukraine or the Middle East? Never. Mm -hmm. I, I hear a lot from all sides, what the United States says is a joke, day by day. I mean, the, the U.S. official commentary. Right, there's so a difference th in institutions, right? I mean, you also have the freedom of the press. You have a, a lot of uh, coverage from what's going on. I mean, I'm definitely, I'm not sure that whether we're getting all the truth from all the fronts, but still, yeah. it's, there, there, there's a huge well, the, difference the, between... The, the main difference of institutions between the U.S. and China right now is the United States is in nonstop war. It has been in war in Afghanistan, uh, in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya, in Ukraine. China has not been in one war, mm. not one, mm. since uh, 1980. Mm. And then it was in a one-month war in 1979. That's the difference of institutions. The United States is a war machine. China is not. So mm -hmm. if we want to talk about institutions, we should be serious about mm -hmm. that, which is that we need to sit down and deal with each other. They ask China and Russia, can you ever deal with the United States? All it does is make war. And then we say, how can we deal with them? They're dictators. Well, this is a bunch of rhetoric. Their countries, we're a country. We need to sit down and deal with each other uh, on a responsible basis so we don't blow each other up. Um, on the Russian and Ukrainian front, is there a possibility that uh, peace is not far away on the Ukrainian front, you think? Peace is one phone call away. Mm. The United States president, whoever that is, and it, Biden can do it now, or whoever's president uh, in January 20th, uh, 2025, picks up the phone and says, Vladimir, uh, we're not going to expand NATO to your border. Mm. Then peace comes. This has been about NATO enlargement from the beginning, and mm -hmm. every serious analyst understands this. The Russians had a red line. Do not move NATO to our 2,100 kilometer border. It's like the United States saying to Russia and China, mm -hmm. do not put military bases in Mexico on the Rio Grande. We don't mm -hmm. want you there. Mm -hmm. Well, Russia said that, and the United States said, why do we care? It's none of your business. NATO doctrine is we go where we want. You have no say. Well, you, you get into war if right. you behave that and way. And what about your Ukrainian territories? Ukrainian territories, well, Ukraine could have kept every inch of its territory in 2013, but then right-wingers and the United States signed up to a coup and mm -hmm. overthrew the Ukrainian government. Mm -hmm. Then Russia took Crimea because it said, we're not going to let our naval base go to NATO, for heaven's sake, which was the plan. And then the Russians did not say, we want territory. They said Minsk agreement. Mm -hmm. What was the Minsk agreement? The Minsk agreement was they, that uh, the Donbass remains Ukrainian territory, absolutely, unquestionably, but with autonomy for the ethnic Russians. You know what? The United States could not accept that. We, we saw articles 2015, 2016, no to autonomy. But it was a UN-backed treaty. Russia wasn't claiming territory. Mm -hmm. Then the US armed Ukraine to go attack the ethnic Russian uh, districts. Now, when I say these things, I'm, I'm told, oh, you're a Putin apologist and so forth. This is ridiculous. You can watch day by day of what happened. US overthrows the government together with right-wing 
Ukrainian nationalists. That everyone understands that. Minsk II agreement, the United States tells the Ukrainian government, don't worry about the Minsk II agreement. Oh, but it's UN Security Council back. Ah, UN, don't worry about that. 2021, Putin says to Biden, look, draft security arrangement. Keep NATO out of Ukraine. Stop putting your missile systems next to our borders. What does Biden say? Biden says, uh, we don't have to talk to you about any of that. Mm. Special military operation starts. Within days, Zelensky says, okay, okay, we'll take neutrality. And then Boris Johnson, I can't even use the words on polite company, is sent by the United States to tell the Ukrainians, don't sign that. Mm. So there could have been peace all along. Right. Instead, there have been hundreds of thousands dead. And what do we hear in our newspapers in, in my country? Just complete, complete rhetoric, complete fabrication of the reality that we block the peace at every single step because our deep state wanted U.S. military bases surrounding Russia in the Black Sea region. Very simple, very straightforward. Okay, let's conclude this discussion on international affairs and uh, pan the camera into the climate change and the sustainable development. In your view, what are the most urgent actions that government worldwide must take to combat climate change? Well, I have to stay on geopolitics for one minute. As yeah. long as there's war, there's no attention to climate change. Mm, mm, okay, so mm. the war is the biggest distraction. But what's happening as we're having these wars? We had the hottest year in the history of Earth not only since the temperature recordings of the 19th century, but probably for the last 125,000 years, mm -hmm. as best as mm -hmm. the scientists can tell us. Everywhere I'm traveling, droughts, floods, heat waves, new spread of disease like dengue. You couldn't even travel in Latin America this past year because dengue was so, uh, so much of an outbreak because of the warmer temperatures. So our climate's getting wrecked. And Greece, of course, is in one of the, the literal hotspots of the world. The Eastern Mediterranean is being devastated by climate change. What do we need to do? We know what we need to do. We need to go to renewable energy, to a zero carbon energy system by mid-century. What's everyone doing in the Eastern Mediterranean? Scrambling for the natural gas underneath mm -hmm. the Mediterranean instead of the renewable energy. So right. this is the, the point is absolutely clear. But many Stop argue the that wars, this go to renewables, mm -hmm. uh, then we have a chance. For many safety. argue that all this transformation gets uh, a, a great deal of uh, uh, of capital for most countries. It will entail a fundamental transformation of the global economy. What's your stance on this? It's a deep transformation. It's not a fundamental transformation in that. Probably what's needed is four or five percent of GDP invested in the energy system mm. worldwide over the next 30 years. But instead of coal, oil and gas, it's mm -hmm. invested in wind, solar, hydro, other zero carbon energy sources. This mm -hmm. is the basics. It's it's a deep transformation. It's manageable. It's not the change the world situation except to protect the world. But we have to do it, and we've not taken it seriously. In my country, in the United States, the oil, gas, and coal lobby is very powerful. And so one of our presidential candidates, uh, Donald Trump, says, oh, it's, it's a myth. It's, it's, it's all exaggerated. There may be some difference of politics in the two parties there, more than in foreign policy, maybe a little bit. Uh, but both parties have a lot of funding from the oil, gas, and coal lobby. This mm -hmm. is the reality. So we're not making the transformation globally at anything like the rate that we need for safety right now. Could mm -hmm. we do it? Of course we could do it. Should we do it? Well, if you love this region, as I do, if you love the Mediterranean, you'd like to protect it from devastation. It will be devastated if we continue with the uncontrolled human-induced right. climate change. And an issue that is universal is the cost of living and uh, current inflation trends in different uh, regions uh, are you know, pressing households around the Western uh, world. What policies can government implement to mitigate its impact on households? There have been a, a lot of uh, shocks mm -hmm. in the world. The wars, 
COVID was a huge shock. Probably, though, I know this would digress us, uh, but probably also a, 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 a laboratory-made virus, most likely from all of the evidence. Uh, U.S.-China scientific work, a disaster. We have to avoid the human-made shocks. Then the cost of living will control itself. Mm. But if you have wars, if you have pandemics, uh, if you have disruptions to the supply chain, if, uh, if uh, China and the United States are saying, break all the supply chains, don't buy Huawei, you have to buy this, you can't buy that. Well, of course you're gonna have inflationary pressures. Mm -hmm. Those are so-called supply shocks. I can tell you uh, as personal experience, 44 years ago, I wrote my dissertation, uh, PhD dissertation at Harvard University on supply shocks of the 1970s. I've seen this before, we do it again, but these are human induced. If we calm down, if we had less conflict, uh, if we were more responsible, the cost of living would uh, be under control. And we're months away from the US elections. How do you see the campaign so far, especially on the economic front? Pretty meaningless uh, in, in the sense that it's a, a show. Uh, the main thing is uh, the Democrats have these billionaires behind them. The Republicans have these billionaires behind them. Lo and behold, on both sides, the billionaires say, don't tax us. So this is pretty much constant across the board. Mm -hmm. This is theater. This is not uh, how American policy is really made. Mm -hmm. Professor Sachs, thank you very much for being with the National Television here in Greece. I'm delighted.